The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. This is Jennifer Schaus from Washington, D.C. <coughs> we are presenting another series in our B2G government contractor webinar series. Today we're focusing on mergers and acquisitions in government contracting, and we're joined by Bob Dinkle and Rob Tilson from Pierce Capital Partners. As always, our webinars will be recorded. And uh, if you have any questions, please submit those uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. And we'll address all of the questions at the end. Uh, first, we wanted to make some introductions and thank some of our partners. FedBit Speed is a software program uh, that allows government contractors to manage opportunities that they're finding on FedBiz Ops. So once you find an RFP or solicitation that you're going to respond to, FedBitSpeed allows you to manage that internally within your company and assign different project managers or proposal writers to manage that process through to submission. Our other partner here today is Fierce Government. They're a DC-based firm, and they publish a lot of great information about uh, IT issues within the government, including cybersecurity. Uh, defense issues, uh, as well as issues around um, cloud computing. So they're, uh, it's a free service. Uh, they've got a lot of white papers, and they promote different events and, uh, and provide some great information. So we encourage you to take a look at both of these uh, companies' websites after the webinar. Fierce Government is fiercegovernment.com, and Ted Bidspeed is fedbidspeed.com. So we want to thank both of them for helping uh, promote our webinars. Uh, next, we come to Pierce Capital Partners, uh, who is making our presentation today. The company was founded in 1988. Uh, most of the management team is a, uh, is a group of experienced government contract experts coming from various uh, major firms in the uh, government contracting industry. And their services include mergers and acquisitions, private equity, joint ventures, and various financial advisory services. And Bob and Rob will go into their services further in the presentation. Uh, my company is here in Washington, D.C., and we help companies primarily with GSA schedules, as well as federal sales and marketing. Uh, additionally, we host events over at the Kennedy Center for Government Contractors. And I've got the link included there for our previous recorded webinars, as well as upcoming uh, webinars that were included. OK, now we're going to dig into the presentation, and I will turn everything over to uh, Bob Finkel and Rob Tilson. All yours. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, what is the current market for mergers and acquisitions in the government uh, marketplace? Well, the last half of last year, there were it was a really active market because a lot of sellers were trying to beat the uh, end of the year and the increase in uh, taxes for capital gains. And after the first of the year, since the first of the years, it's slowed down quite a bit. But as the larger companies start figuring out they're not going to make their growth goals organically, they're starting to uh, think about making acquisitions in order to make their uh, uh, revenue goals. And smaller companies are finding it very difficult uh, from a cash flow point of view. Contracts have been delayed. They have people on the bench, and uh, some of them are willing to talk about merging with a stronger financial partner. Uh, unfortunately for the sellers, the market valuations have declined quite a bit, uh, mainly because it's very difficult for the buyer to see visibility in the revenue forecasts of the uh, company to be acquired. Uh, you know, all LPTA and all the other issues. Uh, so it's very difficult to forecast revenue. Uh, and of course, the buyers have to have these acquisitions be accretive, meaning that the, the has to increase their earnings as well as their uh, revenues. Bob, do you have any uh, additional information? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I, w I would say that uh, you're square on. Uh, the other thing that's affecting the market, of course, is the carryover from last year. There uh, was a lot of uh, uh, hype 
and uh, a lot of companies were in the queue to be uh, sold, but the transaction didn't happen. So we're we're dealing with that this year, and the uh, as uh, Rob pointed out, the uh, sellers are finding it's a different market. It's it's not going in their direction, but it is a very active buyer's market. Uh, I think all in all, we're going to see uh, in the services space, especially government uh, contract services space, a flattening of the, uh, you know, the, uh, if you want to say valuations and things, where um, they, they have declined, and uh, there's no, no short-term uh, forecast of, of that getting better at the current time. So this is just some examples of uh, the lower outlook. Um, you can all read that on your own, I guess. Why don't we move on? So the valuation metrics, of course, uh, the main thing that we see are the buyers wanting to get into particular agencies or under specific IDIQs where there are large budgets, you know, CPI03, um, site under this, uh, the T4 and VA are just some examples. And so the, the, the companies, the small, especially the smaller businesses that are on those IDIQs are targets uh, for companies uh, looking for uh, op revenue opportunities. It always, in any acquisition, I don't care what industry you're in, a strong management team is, is always important, especially in the BD area. Uh, obviously, that's what the buyers are looking for. Uh, and they don't want butts and seats types of business. They want a high margin, um, high priced uh, personnel, uh, if possible. They'd like to see some valuable uh, IP, um, especially in some of the hot areas, uh, which we'll go into in a second. Um, and they'd like to see full and open contracts versus set-asides. Why don't we move on? So if you note down below, the, the hot areas are health IT, uh, cybersecurity, of course, Info assurance, geospatial, and uh, to the extent you have some of those uh, with security clearances, you can see up above uh, the EBITDA multiples are higher. Uh, if there's not much IP and it's you know, uh, but you maybe have five-year contracts and you're earlier into your contracts, you might be able to get uh, in the five times arena. Bob, do you have anything to add? I think that's uh, pretty much so square on, at least what we're finding as we kind of canvass the uh, the marketplace and, and finding, uh, you know, the results being reported are pretty much so uh, square on with these uh, valuations. So uh, as I mentioned uh, last year, all of a sudden uh, come around uh, July, August, all these sellers were saying, oh my goodness, the capital gains is going to go up. We better quickly put our company up for sale. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. And in fact, we estimate only 35, 40% of the companies that were went on the market in the last half of last year actually closed. And why didn't they close? Because they didn't plan ahead. The process requires uh, the seller to uh, look at their operations very carefully, bring in somebody like Pierce Capital Partners uh, and your favorite accounting firm and law firm. You need a good team. And we need to go through all your records, um, and make sure everything is, is in good order. You've paid all your uh, state sales taxes. You don't have any uh, lawsuits outstanding, et cetera, et cetera. And once we've done that, uh, we prepare what is known in the trade as a book or a confidential infra, in, uh, information uh, packet. 
And the buyers, the first place they go is to the contract waterfall, which is a list of all your contracts uh, going down the left side. And then across describes the type of contract it is, uh, the length of the contract, and your projections for revenue, uh, the margins on the contract, et cetera. All of that so we can prepare a financial forecast because the buyer doesn't care what you've done up until today. They care about what's going to happen after they buy the company. Uh, the other reason, of course, they make acquisitions is to get the key personnel. You've got people who know certain agencies particularly well or they have uh, high levels of education, which allow higher billing rates. Um, Bob, you want to go through uh, the complete process after we prepare the book? Yeah, if, you know, even even as we uh, get the book going, probably the initial st steps when we're putting the team together, we put together a uh, kind of usually a one and at max two page. Uh, we call it the uh, term used as a teaser, and it describes the seller's company in a very high level without naming it, and that's basically the initial start of the uh, process. We get the seller to approve the teaser, pass it by the accounting and legal team, and get it out on the market, basically uh, starting the process and working our way up to uh, preparing for this uh, book process and getting a uh, an NDA in place, but you know, marketing the company to select firms that uh, will have an interest in the particular segment that the uh, seller addresses. But the uh, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to and and then we at Pierce are responsible for figuring out whether the people who respond have the money to pay. Uh, pretty important thing. Um, and so they fill out the NDA and we go and meet with our client and see if these people are people they be interested in uh, merging with. Uh, if so, then we set up management meetings, which is kind of a show and tell between both sides. Uh, the, the buyer is trying to sell the uh, seller on their uh, abilities to make their employees feel warm and fuzzy after the uh, acquisition. And of course, the seller is trying to show that they will help the buyer uh, sell more business and get into new agencies, et cetera. Uh, Bob, you want to continue on? The, uh, the process, I guess, I, I used to... Uh kid a little bit saying, you know, we're getting ready, uh, we're, we're doing some uh, dating and getting ready to walk down the uh, the aisle. But, uh, you know, nothing is completed until uh, the final uh, purchase agreement is signed, getting, getting everything keyed up and uh, ready to go. But the, uh, the, the process itself, as we uh, talk about a little bit further, you know, it does take time ensuring that both the buyer and seller are, uh, you know, the, the right mix. That's a, a very important uh, process that Pierce goes through uh, early on to ensure that it is going to uh, work out going forward. Uh, let's stay back on that slide, uh, Jennifer. Um, a lot of sellers ask me about the LOI. In fact, we've had seminars just on the LOI, letter of intent. Uh, years ago, the letter of intent wasn't as important a document it is as, as it is today. Uh, when you receive a letter of intent, in the letter of intent, there will be one paragraph that is binding if you sign it, which basically is an ex exclusivity paragraph. And when you sign that, You've taken your company off the market. You can't talk to anybody else after you've signed the LOI. So therefore, over the last few years, more and more of the terms and conditions of the acquisition uh, are put into the LOI. 
because the uh, seller doesn't want to take themselves off the marketplace if uh, you know everybody is in agreement on the price, maybe management consulting contracts for the uh, the seller's owner, um, any other kind of conditions that the buyer has uh, regarding, say, novation of contracts, etc. So the LOI has become uh, much more important, uh, and usually the exclusivity period is a minimum of 45 days, and generally doesn't run much longer than 60 days. Um, once you've signed that, then everybody goes into due diligence. And the reason you give the buyer exclusivity is they're going to spend money now coming in and doing the due diligence. They've got their lawyers. They've got their accountants. And so the, the meter is running from the buyer's point of view. And so in, in return for them spending that money, you agree to take yourself off uh, the uh, marketplace. And then the fine uh, negotiations on uh, how much working capital you have to leave into the company and, and other things are negotiated generally between the M&A lawyers on both sides of the table. I think okay. the other thing we find uh, also on that, Rob, is that many of the LOI terms and conditions that are worked out in the uh, back and forth will most likely wind up in the purchase agreement. So there is some yep. uh, advantages to getting uh, some of that uh, work out of the way. I think I've already gone over preparing for the, the sale, but to put a fine point on it, if you're 20 million and up, uh, the buyer is going to require you to be doing a financial audit and at least have two or three years of financial audit. You know, if you're a five to ten million dollar company, nobody really expects you to do the audit and you probably only have two or three contracts, so it's it's not going to be as difficult. But as I say, twenty million and up, uh, your accounting firm will have to perform an audit, which costs more than your normal yearly reviews. Um, your legal structures, you have to make sure you don't got them, you don't have employees who have some sort of equity or stock agreements or any kind of agreement that could uh, mess up the, uh, the acquisition. Uh, ESOPs have trustees that have to agree to the acquisition if they have more than 50% of the stock. And then I mentioned all the other uh, sort of uh, accounting issues. Bob, you want to go through the closing because you're an expert in that. Oh, the closing. Of course, the uh, probably one of the biggest things, and it's and it's uh, something that's talked about during this due diligence process, and, and in fact, probably from day one, is uh, thoughts and ideas on how uh, you integrate the two companies. You know the. The aspect can be one of, uh, in some cases, leaving the uh, the seller's company alone as a standalone operating unit for a period of time, to integrating it into uh, a bigger operation day one, and everything in between. So the the process of uh, integration, as well as ensuring that there's a kind of a cohesive co structure and culture, is uh, is truly you know one of the, the key ingredients the last thing you want from a buyer's perspective is to see uh, a, a let's say an exodus of staff which is the key thing when you're looking at a service company that's what you're buying you're basically buying contracts and staff escrow uh, release is one of those things where when uh, certain terms and uh, conditions are met the escrow is released uh, that that can occur anywhere from uh, 90 days to uh, sometimes a, an escrow is required for the first six months to a year, and that's all right. part and, of the. Yeah, we should point out that a general condition in most purchase agreements is that 10%, roughly 10% of the purchase price, 
uh, is held in a uh, escrow account, uh, you know, supervised by uh, a legal entity, and just to uh, provide insurance to the buyer that there isn't anything terribly wrong. And as Bob just mentioned, uh, the, the escrow can be anywhere from six months to uh, to a year. And, and you know, uh, as important as I mentioned, the last thing you want to see is employees leaving uh, the, the the new seller the seller's company. So many times, uh, it's common to see some sort of uh, retention programs. Uh, what kind of uh, bonuses or some kind of uh, possibly uh, stock earn can be put in place for key employees if they stick around uh, for the first year and beyond. And uh, that can be set up to ensure that uh, the key employees are comfortable with the new environment. You know, the other aspect that the, uh, the seller may be dealing with uh, are uh, new contracts and goals that have he's uh, proposed or she's proposed to the buyer. And uh, a lot of times sellers will put in place earnout uh, arrangements where if certain goals and achievements are made, there's additional uh, monies to be had for the, uh, for the seller. But, uh, you know, if we can avoid any kind of earnout kind of situation, it's uh, usually better for all. Rob, you want to talk about these time frames? Yes. So assuming your company's records are all in good order and everybody, uh, and you've got audited statements if they're required, it only takes us maybe 30 to 45 days to put together the book and begin the marketing program. Uh, getting response for the people we send the teasers to and setting up management meetings can take anywhere from four to six weeks. Uh, and once an LOI is signed and due diligence, uh, most due diligence can be done in 45 days. Uh, so you're talking overall a minimum of, say, four months uh, to maybe six months. So, you know, get your house in shape early. You know, uh, try to understand why somebody would want to buy you. Um, and through the whole process, uh, make sure you have a team of people uh, working on your behalf, such as an uh, investment banking firm like us, a good M&A lawyer, uh, your accountants, so that you keep your eye on the business. Uh, you don't want to be distracted while this process is going on. I, I try to use the uh, analogy that, uh, you know, it's like selling your house, which everyone can usually relate to. It's uh, one of those things where you don't decide on a Friday that your house is going to go on the market uh, the next day. There's usually some uh, stagings, there's some cleanup, there's some walls that need painting, the yard needs fixing up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and you know that the same same analogy can be applied to a, a company. Take a step back, put yourself on the other side of the table, and uh, why would uh, why would you buy this firm? So, I think we can leave it at that. And Rob, do you have anything else to to add? No, nope, unless there are any questions. Uh, thank you both for, uh, for a great presentation. It was very informative. And it looks like we do have some questions coming in, so let me go ahead and read them, and uh, you guys can decide if you're going to draw straws to, uh, to answer them. Uh, the first one reads, what is the number one reason that deals do not go through? Not uh, preparing ahead of time. As I mentioned, uh, uh, not having all your contract records and your accounting records in place. Um, that's that's mainly it, and having a realistic uh, view on price. Um, as I mentioned, the prices started going down in the second half of last year because of sequestration, LPTA, and a variety of other things. And the sellers 
uh, weren't recognizing that the buyers couldn't pay as much as they used to, and mainly because of lack of visibility of future revenues. Bob, you have any other things to throw in there? No, that's. Uh, I think those are all the the components right now. Uh, you know, of course, false expectations, as you indicated, uh, sometimes. You know, the seller will uh, forecast uh, additional opportunities and awards that are included in in their numbers and if uh, if those things don't come come to fruition that can uh, change the uh, the seller's uh, valuation and uh, many times the uh, the buyer will change the price uh, next question reads, if I have in-house counsel, do I still need an outside lawyer, and can both the buyer and seller use the same attorney? <laughs> uh, no, on both. There are attorneys in the Washington, D.C. area that specialize in doing mergers and acquisitions of government contractors, which is a bit different than other industries, because, of course, you have all of these novation issues, set aside uh, contracts, um, and so it's just a different marketplace. And so your your traditional corporate lawyer doesn't spend all day doing M and A. So you really need an M and A lawyer, and it'd be pretty difficult for that person to be like a as Bob brings up real estate, it'd be like a real estate agent you know, representing both the buyer and the seller, uh, that just doesn't work. Uh, the next question reads, is the company being purchased always smaller than the buyer? No, uh, that's generally the rule. But if the uh, smaller company makes more money, um, they could be the acquirer. So it's generally a financial question. Yeah, I guess yeah, you can use the term "cash is king" when uh, when it comes to transactions like this, and and we've seen it where smaller companies uh, have acquired larger companies. It's uh, we, not that uncommon. Yeah, we actually have a deal going on right now where a four million dollar company is acquiring a twenty million dollar company, but that's because the four million dollar company has a private equity fund uh, behind them who is supplying the capital. So it. it differs in every situation. Uh, and our next question reads, if a foreign company wants to do business in the U.S., can they purchase a American company? Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I've, see, I, I've seen this uh, in the past. And in fact, it's a, uh, a quick way to, you know, if you want to use the term time to market, if a foreign company wants to get into the U.S. market. Uh, some of the concerns, obviously, are in the uh, more sensitive areas of the government, especially if you're looking at uh, government contractors. You know, if the uh, seller is working with the intelligence community, if the seller has uh, DOD contracts, this sometimes requires additional government approvals in leading up to and uh, at what they call a proxy board, which uh, basically puts puts up a wall between the uh, foreign headquarters and the U.S. operations. But uh, we, we see it. It's not, not, not that uncommon. Yeah, one of our partners, uh, Don Foley, as a matter of fact, sits on the proxy board for CGI. Uh, CGI is a Canadian, Canadian company that bought AMS uh, quite a few years ago. And the government requires a, a proxy board uh, such that the uh, American uh, executives report to the board, and the board is made up of uh, U.S. citizens. Okay. Uh, next question reads, what is the impact of the legal structure of the company of both the buyer and the seller? Rob, why don't you take that one? You want to repeat that, Jennifer? Sure. What is the impact of the legal structure of the company or both okay. the buyer and the seller? Well, generally speaking, we see uh, a lot of uh, subchapter S uh, companies here in the D.C. area. And 
and that sub S corporate company basically has to have, I think it's less than 35 or 50 uh, shareholders, and a corporation can't be a shareholder. Uh, and in that case, uh, when it is a subchapter S, um, the buyer can get some advantages, tax advantages, uh, on uh, the acquisition because they're able to what is known as write up the assets or increase the value of the assets, which is uh, a tax benefit to the buyer. Uh, if they're two corporations, both C corps, uh, then uh, there isn't much uh, uh, impact on the uh, on the uh, transaction. Okay. Uh, the next question reads, at what point should both the buyer and seller alert their employees? Well, that's a good question. Uh, obviously, the CFO or um, accountant or what, whatever the, the uh, title is of the individual who's doing the uh, day-to-day accounting, uh, that person is, is going to have to be involved. Um, it may even have the contracts person involved. And uh, the buyers will probably want to meet the head uh, of business development, which in a small company is probably the uh, owner. But uh, in a slightly larger company, the uh, BD, uh, BD person would, would be involved. It probably doesn't make much sense to go beyond the uh, the, the top team, three or four uh, at max. Uh, it's always hard to, ha hard to hide the transaction. Most meetings are held uh, at our offices, Pierce offices, um, or the buyer's office, uh, so, so that there's not a lot of people walking in and out of the uh, seller's company. Uh, the idea is when the LOI is signed or when the purchase agreement is signed, then there's a formal communication and all your ducks need to be in order as far as benefits and, uh, you know, is, is the uh, seller company, is it going to remain as a standalone company or is it going to be integrated? So you want to make sure uh, that you have your communication, HR communication, and uh, all, all lined up before you let the general uh, employee population know. Great. Okay, thank you. It looks like it uh, that wraps it up for the questions. Anything else that uh, either of you wanted to add? Any final points? No, just no it's just that, Jennifer. You want to make sure you understand why you're selling your company. Or on the other side, you, you really want to make sure that the company you're buying fits your strategic uh, plan ahead of time. Um, so if both sides have planned it, it uh, stands a much better chance of succeeding. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for this opportunity. Sure. Yes. Oh, thank you, Ben. Our contact information is there. We, we would welcome anybody who's inquiring. Great. Thanks, Bob and Rob and Pierce Capital Partners, and thanks to all the attendees for dialing in today. And uh, stay tuned for our next uh, webinar, which will be on financing and uh, financing strategies for government contractors. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>